Hello and welcome to the Somerset Archaeological and Natural History Society, which is usually known as SANS. My name is Lizzie Indooney and I'm a trustee for SANS. Today, Julian Orbach will be talking about the chapels and meeting houses of Somerset. Julian has been the president of SANS and is currently the vice president. He's well known in Somerset for his revision of Somerset, uh, Pevsner Somerset South and West. This was the fourth of such five volumes he's been involved with, having collaborated on the Buildings of Wales series and the revision of Pevsner's Wiltshire Guide. His long interest in non-conformist buildings began many years ago when he was the architectural advisor to the Victorian Society. This interest developed during his time in Wales, where he wrote reports specifically on the listing of chapels. His index of architects in Wales, uh, a byproduct of the building of Wales, buildings of Wales volumes, was um, an important it was important in identifying little known architects and builders of chapels there. This Welsh index has since been joined by two others, Somerset and Wiltshire, similarly compiled during the Pevsner research and available on his website to anybody who wants to use them. So as usual, uh, Julian will take questions at the end of the talk. To ask questions, you'll need to activate the chat button at the bottom of the page and type in a question. To find the button, just run the mouse over the bottom of your screen and a series of buttons should pop up. If the button's not there, it might be at the right, uh, top right or even hidden under three dots. Because we're recording this lecture, we won't be using names. It's free to register uh, for the talks, but a donation of five pounds towards ongoing costs of SANS would be greatly appreciated. The donations button is on the SANS website donations page. When donating, please label your donation chapels. To make things easier, a link to the donations page will also be posted in the chat button at the end of the lecture. So over to Julian. Thank you. Thank you and um, welcome. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to give my, my uh, lecture on Zoom and think that uh, we're talking to people across, across the broadcasting to the nation, I suppose, is the best way to put it. This talk is a second or even third version of one that I gave quite a while back um, on successive nights in Martock and South Petherton because both towns have very similar but remarkably odd Methodist chapels. Let's have an image of them. Um, and uh, next, uh, this one. As you see, really rather odd. They aroused my interest and led to my finding out about their designer, um, Alexander Lauder, Scottish architect or Scottish, Sc Scottish background, obviously with a name like that, based in Barnstable, of whom at the time I knew nothing at all. I'm going to come back to Lauder later on in the in the thing, but it was it was the extraordinary thing that these two chapels in 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 in, in towns not far apart were so similar and um, so distinctively odd. But the county of Somerset, to start at the beginning, it's very rich in the architecture of nonconformity, fundamentally because it's a non-conforming county, despite the formidable Anglican presence in 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 the diocese of Bath and Wells. Nonconformity always flourished where the population was relatively free of the constraints of established landowners and their cousins among the clergy. And Somerset as a county has fewer of the great estates than other English counties. It has a tradition of yeoman farming. And most important, it has a very long history of industrialization, giving more independent populations, most obviously in the, in the towns, but extending far, far into the countryside through the nature of early industrial work, especially weaving, stone quarrying and coal mining that were not necessarily urban at all in Somerset as, as in other parts of the country. If any of you have come across the diaries of the Reverend John Skinner, the antiquarian, who was vicar of Camerton in the early 19th century, you'll recollect his howl with pain uh, right through the diaries and seeing what he felt was a social order collapsing through the influences of coal mining, Methodism and alcohol, which I hasten to say is more of a Venn diagram than a necessary threesome that come together. But, but it starts much, much earlier and Skinner is only, Skinner's reacting really to coal mining as 
as gentlemen vicars did in so many parts of the country. But what's called the old dissent, that's the beginnings of nonconformity in the 17th century, was born of Puritanism and born of opposition to the ritualist tendencies of the Church of England under the early Stuarts, Archbishop Lord, for instance. And dissent was very strong in Somerset. Um, and it, it, it becomes very political in, in the most important towns, Bridgewater and Taunton, um, translating into support of Parliament in the Civil War, and both Taunton and Bridgewater were massively attacked and, and damaged in Civil War actions. And evidence of active congregations after the Civil War can be found in, in all the branches of the old descent. So if one takes the denominations, we're talking about the Quakers, the Baptists, the Presbyterians and the Independents, who later become known as the Congregationalists. Uh, next, please. Um, on the left is by far the earliest chapel of our region. It's not actually in Somerset. It's just over the border at Horningsham, the village of Longleat. And it doesn't actually look as early as, 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 as it's reputed to be. The story was that the thin family brought down Scottish workmen and the Scottish workmen were Presbyterians and there was obviously no Presbyterian chapel anywhere near the building of Longleat and the family allowed them to have um, a chapel built in 1566-7 um, on the Longleat estate and it makes it um, much much earlier than any other chapel in the south of England but the building that you're looking at in the photograph um, is probably rebuilt around 1700 but a very very pretty thing to go and find. Um, our built chapels, as opposed to the, the built chapels of Somerset, um, as opposed to the houses that were used for meetings in, among early congregations, generally date from after the Toleration Act of 1689, though a year earlier, 1688, is the date that Daniel Defoe gives for, for the Presbyterian Church in Bridgewater, which is on the right-hand picture. Um, like many Presbyterian congregations, it later migrated to the Unitarians and was rebuilt a century later to become the proud and famous building to which um, Samuel Coleridge walked um, the extraordinary distance from Holford where, they, where, 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 where he and the Wordsworth were, were, were living um, to preach, uh, he being a Unitarian. But I think I can see it, well, as you look at that picture, you'll see that there's quite clearly something, something in the way of stonework going up the first third of the wall up to where it starts being rebuilt in brick. And I think that's probably um, our earliest chapel, that is the 1688 chapel, um, just the base of it. And the Unitarian Chapel at Shepton Mallet, built in uh, 1692 or 1696, um, uh, was similarly a Presbyterian church that, 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 that went Unitarian later. But the boiling and burgeoning heart of cloth towns in, in Somerset is Froome. And Defoe writes about it you know, very splendidly about how, how, how interesting, how much was going on there at the time. And next, uh, next one. It's the site of the most, I mean, one of the most extraordinary chapel fronts um, in Britain for its period. And this is the Rook Lane meeting of 1707. And interestingly, the as happening quite a lot in, a, in, in um, particularly post-Civil War nonconformity, the foundation of, the, of Rook Lane is to do with the vicar being ejected from the parish church, so that when the Stuarts are restored in 1660, there's a, a, there's a reckoning with all the clergymen who were thought to have, to have uh, veered too close to Parliament, to Cromwell, and to Puritanism, and very large numbers were ejected, and uh, that included the, the vicar of Froome. But Froome was, was a cloth town, and there was an awful lot of money. And this chapel reputedly held a thousand people and was paid for by one single clothier, Robert Smith. And extraordinarily, we also know the name of the person who built it, one of the earliest local names, um, of an architect or builder um, in, in, in uh, earliest known ones in, in Somerset. And he's called James Pope. We couldn't definitely say that he was the designer because it's such a sophisticated design for that period that um, if we knew more about Pope, one could possibly say that he was the designer, but it's equally possible that 
that the design was um, was was drawn up by somebody else. Um, but Rook Lane stands for the kind of strength that nonconformity was having due to congregations of working people um, whose combined wealth, they weren't necessarily any of them wealthy themselves, was accumulating to clothiers whose distrust of being part of the established church meant that they were prepared to put their money um, into, um, into such, such glorious buildings. Uh, next. Um, inside on the left, the, the, the Rook Lane went derelict for many years, hence the reconstructed galleries, you'll see that. But one of the extraordinary things you'll see is, is this colossal stone column, like something out of the Forum in Rome that supports the roof. The reason for this is that the vast spans, in order to, to seat a thousand people, you needed a huge, roughly square space. And those of you who know the story of the Sheldonian Theatre in Oxford, where, where the great thing is the, is the hidden engineering that Wren did to put a ceiling over this vast, uh, well, then vast space. Um, and this problem bedevils uh, the largest early chapels in, in, in around 1700 because no one locally had ever built one or ever built anything that wide. And the solution was to, to put a column right up the middle and then, and then balance everything on that so you didn't have, have to deal with the, the huge spans that, that Wren was, was able to, to deal with. And um, the interesting thing is that the same solution is found um, only a few years later, 14 years later, in the Unitarian Chapel at uh, Taunton, which is the one on the, on the right. I think the finest surviving chapel interior in Somerset, not often open, but very, very generous people there if you do manage to go and see it, because everything there is spectacular. And I mean, I only suggest that you notice the extraordinarily spir extraordinary spiral wrought ironwork of just the hanger that the, the, the great brass chandelier hangs from. And if you see it closer, it, it is, it's absolutely lovely, lovely work, plus the, the panel galleries, the panel term, um, the pews and, and, and the pulpit and the rest. Um, it's again, it's testimony of the wealth of a, a, a fundamentally cloth town, Taunton, built for a ba Baptist congregation who were there from the, well, had been, gathered together since the 1640s. They went over to becoming Unitarians just before the chapel um, was built. But in this case, we don't know anything of who designed it. Um, but, but you can see the same, the, the same solution to the massive problem of how do you prop up the roof? And it, it, it is, it's a heroic piece of architecture and must have been an extraordinary thing when you think that most people were coming into that space from uh, you know, cottage style buildings uh, very rarely more than two stories. Uh, uh, next, please. Um, there, are, there are, I mean, it is a rich county. It's got some very, very good things. There are early 18th century meeting houses at Ilminster, um, Middle Ambrook and Crookern. Um, Middle Ambrook is Presbyterian and the other two are Unitarian. Um, Ilminster is, is interesting because of this massive uh, double set of columns that holds up the... Um, the, the gallery. Um, it's now the art centre, so easy, easy to visit and go and have a look at. Uh, next. And Middle Ambrook um, is, is, is the tiniest and most delightful thing. It's just worth going in order to understand, as it were, the beauty of simplicity, that this is, this is all, the, the nonconformist interior is about the congregation gathered in prayer and the centerpiece is a pulpit from which I took this photograph. In the smallest ones, the galleries are so close that you feel that they're almost touching the, um, the, 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 the minister in the pulpit. It's densely packed in a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a tiny scale and um, still in use. And uh, I, I highly recommend a, a visit. It's very, very precious um, because such things didn't tend to survive um, all the, all the different changes, particularly of the 19th century, or, or indeed the 20th century, um, uh, closure and removal of fittings. Um, all these early chapels, like, um, uh, well, all the ones I've seen, seen shown you, have a, 
the facade is, is the long wall, i.e. the equivalent of the side wall of a house. Um, and um, they generally had two entrances, two doors that led, out, led each into the, um, the aisle that was, was each side of the, of the pulpit, the pulpit being on the entrance wall and the gallery um, facing it across the width of the, of the building uh, next. So that you see that on the left, that's the picture of the outside of Middle Ambrook. So the pulpit is just between those two windows and those are the doors for the congregation each side. And the tiny little window up top right, and there's another one top left, uh, let in a little bit of extra light to the, to, the, um, to the gallery. But as you saw from my previous slide, the thing is, is really quite, um, it's quite dark at, at gallery level. Though these windows at the front are unusually large. I thought when I first saw them that they were perhaps a later alteration because they are so large. And then I realized that in the moment that chapels were ch changing from having the, 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 the entrance on the long side, the long wall, to having an entrance on the short gable wall, the same windows were occurring. So these gable entry chapels, Crookone top right and Broadway um, bottom right, are, um, well, and they must, there must be a, a single builder involved. You know, these, are, these are across 10 years. And, um, and they are rather an odd window form. So one has to assume that there was somebody within, within the congregations who was, who was designing. And certainly this is something I learned from Wales is that there were many, many people who were, who were capable within the gathered congregation of each of each, each place. And among them, they could generally select um, a metal worker, a smith, a carpenter, and a mason. And these people would get together and, 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 and design and build the chapel. Uh, next. To my mind, the loveliest of all the meeting houses, and Mid Lambrook is beautiful in its simplicity, um, but for total harmony, I mean, an, an absolutely sort of a, um, a, a kind of vernacular elegance. Uh, the Quaker meeting at Long Sutton, um, which has just been um, 300 years old. It's, it's perfectly preserved and the utter simplicity of Quaker furniture um, inside is, is, you can see in these, in, in those very, very simple benches that are still there. And um, up at the top, you'll see the enclosed gallery for the women's meeting. So this was, the, 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 this was um, uh, not the actual service, but, women, but when women had their meeting, this, the, 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 there's a, a separate space uh, with, with, with shutters um, in, the, in, in, in the top part. It is very remarkable, even among Quaker meetings, for everything to survive. We have another one up near Yatton uh, next, um, which is the Cleverham meeting. And you can see the same, the same two-story um, galleried effect and almost identical, um, the simple benches of, of the Quakers. But um, the thing that's quite surprising at uh, Cleverham is that their interest in looking after their own people extended to having um, almshouses and those tiny little wings that stick forward from the, from the, from the chapel itself. It's very, very precious and, and, and really absolutely lovely, 1729, as, as, you, as you can see. Um, by the mid 18th century, the second wave of dissent or, or nonconformity has begun. So if you like, the old dissent should change to the new dissent. It's the evangelical wave that begins with John Wesley's conversion in 1738. John Wesley, like so many ministers, uh, as I've mentioned before, had been a, an Anglican minister. Then he had been inspired to join the Moravians, who were um, the sect founded by Count von Zinzendorf. Um, he came across them in Savannah, Georgia. It's wonderful how somewhere around the 1730s, one suddenly gets this, this global vision. I mean, it's actually always there. Uh, I mean, uh, if, if one goes back far enough, one finds, you know, Huttites in, in, Hussites in Czechoslovakia and, and the Moravians from, 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 from the western end of the country. One will find German Lutherans and, and the rest. But, but, but this sort of extending to the new world, and the traveling backwards and for forwards. Wesley 
finds him finds the religion of his choice in Savannah, Georgia in 1736. It's it's wonderful. And he's back. And uh, well, everybody probably knows Wesley's new room in Bristol opened in 1739, though it's rebuilt at much larger in 1748. But the most interesting chapel of Somerset Chapel of the mid 18th centuries isn't one of Wesley's, but the one built in Bath. Next, please. For Selina Countess of Huntingdon, who is an extraordinary figure. I mean, she's an aristocrat to her bones. I mean, she's the daughter of an earl and the wife of a can't, earl, can't remember what Hastings was, but um, it must have been an earl because she's the Countess of, of Huntingdon, Earl of Huntingdon. And um, she arrives in a town renowned for its um, depravity, Bath, and founds a chapel. And it's a Gothic chapel. And on the front of it is her own house, which is what, what you actually see when you come to it. So it's now the museum of, of uh, the building and architecture of, of Bath. So it's, it's, it's very, very accessible. And um, she's influenced by Wesley. And then she meets a rather more Calvinist, George Whitfield. And she appoints him her, cha her chaplain. And then probably, as you know, there's the wonderfully named separate sect called the Countess of Huntingdon's Connection. But this, the chapel in Bath is built before as it were, she, she, she expands outwards. This is, this is her first. And interestingly, it, it's, um, we don't really know very much about who designed it or anything, but it's, it's right at the beginning of, uh, of Georgian Gothic um, appear, appear, appearing in Bath. And it seems rather frivolous now. And one wonders whether, whether did she choose it because, because of the connections with, with religion or did she just have a frivolous spirit and thought it would be more cheerful than 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 than, than Palladian Bath, but it's it, it is it, it is one of the again one of the other the treasures of, of Somerset nonconformist buildings. In I mean she's early in talking about in thinking about Gothic, but in the later eighteenth century the question of style does begin to impinge quite a lot. Most chapels were classical, while Anglican churches are beginning to slide towards Gothic, but one doesn't want to exaggerate the difference. Um, next. Um, if you look on the, the one on the left, Bower Hinton, it's congregational in an ind independent meeting of 1791. It's still got the long wall front, which is by then very old fashioned, um, but it's got an end wall entry. The long wall front is, 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 is just, uh, so it looks good from the, from the street. And it still has the similar type of windows that we were seeing at Crookern and Midlandbrook and Broadway, but now pointed arched, so that the, the statement of Gothic is, is one can only say, uh, minimal or passing. Wesley himself um, had a bit of a fancy for octagonal chapels, and uh, the one in Taunton, um, still empty and to let probably uh, 10 years after I took that photograph, um, is, is one of the surviving octagonal ones. It opened in, in 1778. It has no, nothing, nothing, um, Gothic, well, very little classical about it. It's just a very interesting uh, formal design for centralizing worship. Um, and Wesley, uh, Wesley wrote how, how pleased he was with it. Uh, next. Um, the Unitarians rebuilt that chapel I showed you the back of, or the little bit of it. They rebuilt the one in Bridgewater um, in 1788 with a sort of Palladian window in the front and, and one of those shell door hoods, which are very typical of, of um, domestic building in, 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 in Somerset um, in, the, in the, well, early to mid 18th century. It's, it's sort of quite, a, quite a, um, a mixed architectural design and the pediment doesn't quite fit to the side, the, the side walls are too high for the pediment and, and so on. But when they got inside, I mean, it's quite a glorious interior because, because they went for these very, very high columns um, and a great long, preaching space. So you have to imagine, you know, this is where this is where Coleridge himself stands, exactly where I took that, fo that photograph um, to, to, to preach. And it, it's, again, one, one has to, 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 to emphasize the, the scale and ambition of nonconformist building in the richer industrial towns. And Bridgewater was definitely very wealthy. It's a, you know, it's, a, it's a port from which people sail to America. It's, it's a landing place for all sorts of things from the interior, um, including, including cloth. Um, the Wesleyans generally were classical 
at the, at the by the in the late 18th century next so uh, Froome in 1810 is about as plain and classical as you can get I mean it's really it's just two stories two stories of windows and it's uh, its quality comes from the fine bath stone and um it's it's it's, it's an effect of the um of the canal system that suddenly it's relatively easy to get bath stone out so when it went to rook lane in 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 the early 18th century it must have cost a fortune to move that stone out out there when it when it gets to Froome, it's it's relatively economical as a as a as a, as a building as a as a building material but bridgewater was a brick town and uh, it's wesleyan chapel which is only a few years later um 1816 um, still, still classical. The whole porch thing is is added later. It's basically started with just arch windows um, on 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 both floors of it. It's a very large scale chapel because well, Bridgewater Bridgewater had an awful lot of um, Methodists at, at the time. Next, the most splendid of them is the Wesleyan Chapel in Bath, and this is where, uh, for the second time, we encounter a named designer. And this one is very interesting. This is the Reverend William Jenkins. He's an early example of a denominational architect who was also a minister. Um, he's a Welshman, obviously with that name. He only designed for the Wesleyan Methodists and um, his, his chapels appeared across Southern England um, and, 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 and into Wales. And he has a son who, 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 who carries on as an architect um, in Wales, but but in the Welsh tradition, you find an awful lot of ministers who designed really to quite high standards um, chapel buildings right the way through the nineteenth century. It's not it's not so obvious in England. Quite soon, we start to see people looking to you know the town builder or the, the anyway ministers who did it uh, are uh, become a uh, uh, relatively rare. Um, Next, um, classicism. I mean, it's it's it, it's pretty elegant. I mean, this is uh, Bridgewater and Chard. The Baptists liked not being Gothic. They didn't want to look like the Anglican Church, and and then you know, then in a way, they're the most consistent of the denominations in choosing non-Gothic styles. It's not universally true by any means, but Baptists in Bridgewater by a local architect called Edwin Down on the left. Uh, you know, the ionic columns. I mean, it could easily be uh, one of the London, um, you know, one of one of the London Regency streets. And then a little bit later, um, charred in the 1840s, um, probably by a local man. But we're not entirely certain because there's a, a suggestion that uh, that the design was 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 given to them. But but, but a very glad, grand, well, temple front, really, I suppose. Uh, next. And sometimes they just made a terrible mess. This is uh, the Wesleyans at Castle Carey, where the arched windows and something about the middle of it sort of suggests that that classical was was what was we were starting with. But the things, the octagonal things going up the corner certainly don't come from any classical tradition. And the things that look like baby's teats on the um, on the top of the, the corners. Um, well, they don't have anything. They don't really come from anything Gothic either. But um, but this is um, a local builder. I mean, quite well known in 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 Castle Carey for for for, for 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 putting out houses and and schools and things. And this is his 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 best known known building. And it's you know it's quite handsome. One has to one has to sort of recognise that someone is trying to do something, not necessarily fitting into the the same format or classical things that were, were animating the people who, who, were, who, were, who were building in, 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 in um, Chard and, uh, and Bridgewater. Uh, next. And it's, you know, it's the year later. I mean, when people wanted to be seriously Gothic, they really could. And some of the congregations, and as I said, not very often the Baptists, decided that they really would go the full the full Gothic, and um, the Congregational Chapel in in Taunton is is convincing. It's an aisled church, you know, with stone arcades inside, as one would expect in a medieval church of that period. I mean, yes, its detail is very simple, but lots of uh, 
Anglican churches of the 1830s and 40s, um, St Michael Bath, for instance, of much the same period, Christ Church Froome, Holy Trinity Froome, uh, uh, play with exactly the same thing, which is basically the Salisbury Cathedral detail, which people thought rightly was cheaper than, than other forms of, of, of Gothic. Um, uh, it's interesting that that Down and Pollard, the names that are coming up are people whose names are not, they're not high up in the in the architecture books. In fact, they just barely make it into the things like the personal volumes because they are they're local builders and they're coming from within, they're almost always from within nonconformity. Their, their families have, have been um, uh, chapel goers uh, for a long time before one or other of the family becomes, becomes a builder. And then um, Pollard eventually calls himself um, an architect. The, the question of the, this question of style for, for churches, it's, it's of course, it's the thing that, that, that burns the Anglican church once uh, in the 1840s. Pugin comes along and tells them that they will they will they will die if they go on um, building churches that look like uh, look like classical boxes or whatever. Um, the Anglican Church is in ferment from the 1840s onwards, and and by relatively quickly and astonishingly quickly by the 18, 18, 1850s certainly um, there is really no there's no alternative to um, to uh, to, 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 to the Gothic. Nonconformists hesitate next. Um, and so there's some very notable classical buildings being built. James Wilson, who's a long, long term, long standing uh, Bath architect. I mean, he's, he's young enough to go into the competition for Nelson's Column in, in Trafalgar Square and old enough to die in 1900. So he has a, he has a very long, a long, uh, period in Bath. And he's interesting in terms of Bath. But what's more interesting about him, I'll tell you in a moment, uh, another, uh, another couple of Baptist chapels, I think, next. Um, yes. So what, what happens, it's not a couple of Baptists, but the, the central Baptist church of the whole, the whole lot, the central Baptist church in London, uh, produces this extraordinary, what one can only say is Italian Romanesque. Um, in 1845, which is very early for that sort of thing. And the thing is that the pressure for Gothic or for to be ecclesiastical looking is beginning to hammer against any idea that one carries on doing classical, because obviously everybody could turn around and say, well, you know, the, the Romans were not Christians. And that's and it is quite a difficult thing to argue against, and nor were the Greeks. And so that the Baptists have a sort of Roman, an Italian Romanesque streak to them that goes right the way through from the central church um, of, yes, J. Gibson, that's man who designed it in the 1840s. And, and it, 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 has its, it has its effects and produces some quite spl splendid things. The congregationals in Bath take up the same odd style in the 1850s, 1854. Henry Goodridge and his son Alfred uh, designed it. Unfortunately, it's been floored over, but I remember it from a very long time ago. Or maybe I only saw photographs, but it had a great two-story octagon, like going inside. It was like going inside a Greek church. It was an absolutely wonderful thing. One hopes one day it will be will be reopened again. But it's uh, e even externally, you can see it's a building of of um, tremendous character. Uh, next, um, the James Wilson I mentioned in terms of the Moravian Church in Bath, of building a classical one. Uh, his most interesting national reputation is that he and a clergyman who'd been trained as a as a, as a as an architect the reverend frederick jobson wrote a well jobson wrote the book and wilson illustrated it in 1850 called chapel and school architecture it has an endless uh, title that goes on basically saying for the use of wesleyans at the end of it but the point of it was that it argued that there were there were only two styles, neo-Norman, neo-Gothic, that were suitable for ecclesiastical buildings, and that the Wesleyan Church uh, had better take stock of it. And um, Jobson asked w Wilson to design the, the, uh, the standard designs, and the centerpiece of the chapel in 
Taunton, 1846, on the, on the uh, left there, is the design that Wilson made uh, for, the, uh, for the book. And it's, it's got a big tracery window in the middle and then a sort of lean-to bit on the side with, with smaller Gothic windows. And there are variations of it all over the country. And the one at Whitney, um, not greatly dif different, um, you can see in the picture because I couldn't get an engraving of the one in Bath, which has been um, which has demolished quite a long time ago, it was in, in New King Street. But um, it, it becomes, Wilson becomes, by accident, I think of his meeting with Jobson, uh, a major figure in nonconformist architecture. So we have a, basically a Somerset architect um, who has churches in, in the Chepstow, Llanetley, right up to Sheffield, I think he went across to Kent, all over the place, uh, because, because religion was a, was, was a country. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a different thing. You could be a local architect in Bath and build things for people in Bath. But if you were an architect to a denomination, you could well end up building things um, all over the country uh, next. And Wilson's great thing was that he invented, almost single-handed, uh, that r ridiculously prevalent public school um, thing of having a tower in the middle and lots of Tudor Gothic windows. And he invented it for the Anglicans in 1840 at Cheltenham College, uh, which you'll, you'll probably remember from the film, If, if nothing else, has a tower in the middle um, useful for boys to, 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 to take aim at things. And um, his Wesleyan connections meant that he built the three colleges for the Wesleyans, one in Horsfury Road, which is long gone. Um, then the Queen's College, it wasn't called Queen's College then in Taunton, um, which was a, a basically an independent school for Wesleyan boys, which is the one on the left. And it's a splendid thing. It's on the, on the south side of Taunton with... Um, Building, building stone of North Curry sandstone, which is very rarely used uh, because it's, it's quite difficult to get hold of and, and there's not a, not a lot of it. But it seems to have weathered and, and stood the test of time really, really well. But it's a very handsome building. You can see that it, it is more or less the same as his Kingswood School in Bath, again, a Wesleyan, a Wesleyan boys' school, uh, moved out from Kingswood in, Gloss, in, in, in Bristol, hence the name. But it's the same. It's the same design. So Wilson is is becoming the go-to um, architect for um, for for the um, the Wesleyan Church. Um, but he didn't actually work exclusively for the Wesleyans. You can find Anglican churches by him, and you can find well, like the Moravian one in Bath, uh, chapels for other other denominations. Other architects all really do rather put their banner up for a particular denomination. There's a chap called William Stent in Warminster, in, over the border in Wiltshire, who's almost his entire career is connected with Congregationalists. And next, uh, Joseph James, who was practicing in London, designed the, th the third of the great um, uh, public schools in Taunton. There's a, one for the Wesleyans, as we've seen by Wilson. There's one for the Anglicans. And the third and last of them is one for this one here, um, uh, 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 Taunton, Taunton School, Taunton School, actually, it's was it Taunton College, huh? um, Taunton School, I think, um, by Joseph James um, for the Congregationalists. And you can see that the model has, has, has acquired a little hat on the top, uh, probably rather similar to what happened to Bristol Temple Mead Station before it was bombed off. But um, it's a, I mean, it's, if you go and see it, it's a beautifully built building and very, very grand. And it's no surprise to find that Joseph James's main claim to fame is he designed that enormous spired um, tower to the, the square church in Halifax. That's sort of, the, I mean, it's one of the places where, they, where they, the, the chapel is far grander than anything, than anything else in the town. While the Gothic does rather win the contest, there are classical ch chapels going on right late on, uh, as late as this one uh, next. Um, Baptists again, this is 1880 in Crookern. Um, really quite, it's quite an elegant design. It's, I mean, I love it that it's stripped back to basically just being glass between, between um, pilasters. It slightly loses, loses coherence on the sides, but, but that front is, is quite a splendid thing. And that Italian Romanesque alternative to Gothic um, does have quite a long life and uh, next. 
Um, on the left, you'll see it was called. This was the style that was was eventually because the Victorians loved categorizing. They loved they loved well labels. So this is Italo Lombard style, um, which doesn't really mean anything to most people in in um, in 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 uh, Britain now, and I don't suppose it meant anything very much then. But it meant basically round arches and those type of Florentine tracery where you get a roundel above two arch windows. So there's North Petherton in um, 1869 and a refronting of an older Baptist church um, in Taunton, Silver Street in, in 1870, um, both by, by, by local architects. Next. But the Gothic, the Gothic is, I mean, is it, it, one couldn't live in the 19th century without feeling that religious buildings needed to be Gothic. It is a very, very strong tide. And, you know, we know ourselves, you know, one can find, you know, Gothic, Gothic churches being built well after the war. And um, what sort of happened was, was that there's a quite a strong, a strong tide that says we'll build Gothic, but we don't want it to look like an Anglican church which tended to mean that the, the details become wild, woolly, and wonderful. And um, perhaps now looked at the one on the left when he did the, his, his, his Somerset book. Um, I, I took it out actually, but he said, I think he actually says that it's um, um, ugly. I think that that's, that's, that's the word, no, hideous, that's the word he used for it. It's by R.C. Bennett of Weymouth. Um, and it's got everything in it. It's got flying buttresses way down low where you wouldn't expect them, and flying buttresses way up high where, you, where one might, but, but rather larger than one would need to support the quite thin spire that's on top. And the tracery is wonderfully, wonderfully wild. So that's Stokes of Hamden. And Bennett did a slightly rather simpler, not, a, 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 a less wild a Gothic chapel in um, South Petherton a, a few years, um, a couple of years earlier. And he's he's another man who's whose main career um, is designing um, for, the, for, the, for the congregational um, church. But it's, it, it's certainly a weird Gothic. And when you look at them from the side and you see those overall roofs, you recognize that what's inside is that single preaching congregational space that is always um, characteristic of, the, of, 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 of nonconformity. Um, they're broad Gothic, gabled front at Willerton and watch it that both for Wesleyan churches uh, next and this one is just bizarre beyond belief this is by a Welsh architect who as far as I can gather no one in Wales has ever heard of he calls himself Morgan H Davis of South Norwood which may be why he's not he's forgotten in Wales um, but what's happening up there is is you know very gothic um, uh, uh, rose window but somehow or other he needs to get either the choir or part of the congregation up into the gallery. And he chooses this wonderfully ostentatious way of taking them right up the, the front of the building, turning left and you know, turning left again and getting them, getting them in, um, in that way. It's a, you know, it, it, it is Gothic, but it certainly would never be, ever be mistaken for, a, for, an, Anglican, for an Anglican Gothic. Uh, next. But it does, I mean, some of them go, do go. I mean, the aisled interior, which is typical of any, the medieval parish church um, occurs pretty convincingly at the, at the Minehead Wesleyan Church of the 1880s, and, and even with the, the striped colours, which are very much a, a Somerset um, uh, medieval feature, having using two different colours of stone. While other um, nonconformist ways of doing things are, are quite, quite different. So Ruskin, as you remember, uh, absolutely deplored the use of a visible cast iron and thought that it was an abomination within a religious context. But when the Methodist church in Taunton was enlarged, massively enlarged, um, they decided, or rather sensibly, that everybody should be able to see. And that it's that practicality that, that animates this design. It's the, 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 the columns are cast iron, they're as thin as possible, everything is Gothic because that's the the feeling that it, that, uh, of the time in the Wesleyan church, but it doesn't look at all like an Anglican one. It's just, they're just thin columns holding this, this really rather magnificent roof, 1868 to nine. So this brings me around full circle to Mr. Lauder again, next. Um, 
he's he's definitely. I mean, I think he is the most individual of the got, even including Mr. Bennett at 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 Stokes of Hamden. Lorda has plays so many variations on on his Gothic that one has to say that he's he's, he's the most individual hand. And he turns up in 1864 at Melbourne Port, which you'll see on the left, with this wonderful tracery. That, well, it's clearly based on, 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 on a railway carriage anti-Macassar or a doily, but it's certainly not, it's not any recognisable medieval Gothic um, rose, rose window. But it's very, very, very self-confident. It's basically saying, you know, I can do Gothic and I don't need to do medieval precedent like all these Anglicans are trying so hard to do. And, um, and then uh, uh, a few years later, he does Yeovil, which is more, it's more bulky. Um, I still think characteristic, mainly for that sort of bulging staircase that comes out of the, 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 the right-hand side uh, next. Um, he had a nasty setback when he went to watch it, where he had the thing which often happens to architects even today where he was selected to design the church there. And then one of the committee members, somebody called Robert Williams, as far as I can gather, was, 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 was a farmer, but he obviously had, had, had talent, um, offers to design the church for a lot cheaper. And so they went, they went, uh, they went with Williams and Lorda, Lorda didn't get what was actually a commission for quite a large chapel and ends up with uh, the rather smaller one on the, on the left at, uh, at Burnham. In 1878 to 80, but the tracery there is still still quite fun, but nothing like. Uh, I mean, everything's a foretaste for the Cook Memorial Chapel at, at South Petherton on the right, where you've got this um, the, the, the the space rocket spire just leaping from ground to top, and all that quite chunky tracery, and a series of up and down roofs all the way down that down that down that down, down the side. To just to animate the exterior because it's seen from 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 two sides, and it's it's um, next. It's full of detail. I mean, full of chunky detail. Really, really big on personality, I would say. Um, and that funny octagonal uh, spike on it next turned out when I've been looking at it for a while, I suddenly realised what it is is it's a thinning. The medieval tower of South Petherton Church um, to sort of knitting needle proportions. And um, he must have liked it uh, very much indeed next, because as I showed you at the beginning, he did it again even thinner at Martok. And this thing really is a spike. I mean, there's barely, uh, it looks like a bell tower, but if, the, if the, it's got more than one bell, I'd be very, very surprised. Um, it's been, this one's been empty for a, a long time, so I've never. I've never been inside it, but the interior is probably less interesting than this extraordinary um, exterior with those um, uh, those animals sticking out of the out of the top of it, which do occur again on the on the church tower, but not nearly as close together and as prominent as here next. And then on the last of his big ones is Ilminster, where he gets to do a whole tower and spire because Ilminster is is still wealthy. It's a, it's a wealthy industrial town, and 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 the um, you know, the clothiers put their money in. You can just see the corner of the previous chapel uh, on the left in the left-hand picture, showing how, you know, how, how very, very grand um, uh, chapels could get by the 1880s. And the last time I found him uh, in, um, in Somerset is at Kingsbury Episcopi um, in 1899, uh, where he's basically reproducing those sawtooth roofs that we saw at, at South Petherton and that sort of bulge out the side that we saw at Yeovil. But the front is, is, is tamed down because, well, Kingsbury is a vi village and they, didn't, didn't, they weren't, weren't going to spend the kind of money that, that the, the, the bigger places were going to, do, going to do. But the extraordinary thing about Lauder is that this is muscular Gothic of a very, very hard type. So one would expect a muscular bewhiskered person, next please, and there he is, and he isn't muscular. He looks more like a like a the captive of a of a of a of a um, you know tramp steamer. Um, but the extraordinary thing about him is that is that he sets up. He's a one man arts and crafts revival all on his own in Barnstable, and he starts this wonderful pottery, which which just is not hard and chunky at all. It's it's soft and fun and 
and full of quirks. I mean, this, this, this jug is just wonderful. He's the head teacher of the Barnstable School of Art in 1876. He set up a brick making and a pottery company that employed 36 men and six boys by 1881. And, um, and it goes on until 1914, making this, you know, highly prized now, artistic jugs, vases, mugs, terracotta panels for buildings. And rather nicely, uh, next, mm, next, um, Rob Hutchins told me that this particular jug from, um, uh, from the Lord of Pottery has, has just been acquired by the uh, Watchit um, Museum, the one that's in the market house in the, in the, in the middle of Watchit, which is kind of rather appropriate because that was the, the, the chapel commission that, uh, that, that ran away from uh, Lauder. But anyway, a little piece of Lauder has, has just very recently uh, come to rest in, in, in Watchit. And it's, it's lovely. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful and kind of vernacular piece. It's based on you know, old 17th century things, but it's got a flow and it's got a shape. And it somehow, it just doesn't fit with those big, big chunky chapels. The other curious thing about Lauder is that he's the, the master, the trainer of the greatest of, of uh, English arts and crafts architects, W.R. Letherby, who's a, who's a Barnstable boy. And he worked for Lauder for eight years because he was put into the office aged 14. So that Lauder has a great, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a story, there's a bit of Lauder in the arts and crafts um, movement. And uh, next. We're nearly at the end, but I, I felt that it was probably necessary to try and show you one great chapel of the of the the heyday of chapel attendance. This is the sort of chapel where the great, you know, male voice choirs of Wales would have sung from. This is the sort of, you know, the intense interior where if you can imagine the thing packed out and you can see the centralizing of the whole space, um, that the 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 the, the, the fervor of a great chapel uh, service could be felt. This isn't a particularly special one. It's just, it's, uh, it's the Methodist, uh, Wesleyan Methodist one in Radstock, 1901. Um, the special things to notice about this is that the gallery is huge. It goes around all four sides of the chapel itself. Um, that the, the, in the right-hand picture, you can see, uh, as it were, the stepping up of the, the, the centerpieces of the chapel. So you have the communion table, table within its rails. Above that, you have a pulpit, but it's no longer a pulpit for one minister. You'll see a great big bench behind it. And that meant that when there was a very big service, anything up to six ministers from surrounding chapels or very far away could sit there. And then the pews that come above that at gallery level are the ones for the choir. And behind that um, in, its, in, in, in the choir recess is the organ. So that you've got this enormous hierarchy um, of, of, of the things. The only thing that's missing from this, this chapel um, is the pews. And the other thing that is now missing is the entire congregation, because these photographs were taken uh, this year at the very final um, service, uh, the closing service. And, uh, and, and it's now, well, it's now, it's now locked up. I just want to finish because this, this, in a sense, this is this is the, the this is urban nonconformity of the late nineteenth century and into the early twentieth. The big heydays of the of the chapel congregations go right up to the first war, and um, enormous uh, uh, um, presence in each of the towns that they're in, and the decline sets in into war and, and and definitely after the after the second war. I just want to add a little artsy craftsy postscript. And next, just a few, a couple of things. Um, under the Porlock, under the hills at Porlock or near Porlock, is a tiny little uh, Wesleyan Methodist chapel, which is just sweet. It's uh, it's uh, at Bossington, and um, it's just a, a pretty thing made out of all the the, the colours that the architect could get together in you know, the red sandstone, the grey local stone, red brick little bit of timber. It's just playing with materials. It's probably designed for holiday visitors rather than a resident congregation, because those of you who know Bossington, it's a tiny thing, but it's made by a big um, chapel building, church building firm in Bristol, Foster and Wood, who are obviously just enjoying themselves um, with the materials. And the last thing, a strange story, but a lovely one, and next. Um, in two of the chapels, 
uh, Crookham and Ilminster Unitarian churches, there's this, I think, absolutely lovely stained glass, which is completely sui generis. It, it, has, no, it has no other story to it than that Margaret Blake, the daughter of the minister of Crookham, is trained as an artist, only she decides, she in, ends up becoming, becoming the minister at Crookham. And her, all of her work, her stained glass work of the 1920s, is, is, is within those two churches and a few houses. There's very, very little of it around. And yet, to me, it has, it has a kind of simple loveliness that, um, uh, that I, you know, is, 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 is very rare. In a way, it's a, a shame that she didn't, she didn't make more but it's kind of it's kind of an it's a useful thing to bring this lecture to a close on at the idea that that the chapels of our streets aren't they aren't just the street facade there they are there's often more hidden inside they're more interesting things and they represent a strand in the story of somerset well in, as they do in, in every county they represent well a, a series of strands that that knit together into something really quite important and that that uh, sometimes it's artistic and sometimes it's social history but it should never really be ignored in understanding uh, why a county is as it is and i hope that i've given you some idea of, of, of why i think the chapels of somerset are worth going out and looking at but thank you for coming along and listening Julian, that was that was brilliant. You know, I've always wondered why um, there were so many uh, nonconformist chapels in Taunton, and uh, and understanding now, you know, a little bit about the wealth of the clothiers who were working in the town, who were financing it all, um, has, has been absolutely brilliant. Um, yeah, I feel I've, so I've come quite a long journey there between the first chapels and and the later ones and how simple and straightforward the, the early ones were and how huge and elaborate the, the much later ones. Yeah. Um, I was personally quite interested um, with the, you know, you talked about the early chapels that had big columns holding up the roof yes. because they wanted a huge roof span. Did they have ironwork in those? Do you know? Well, the, the, the Rook Lane one is stone. Right. And I, I have to think that the, the, the other one, the Unitarian in Taunton, is wood you know, with all this oh. lovely carving. And I have to think that it's it's cladding something. But you mm. see, 1721, I mean, it's early. To cast, to cast a piece of an iron column of, of that height. Well, uh, yeah. It would be very <laughs> spectacular, wouldn't it? It would just take forever. <laughs> I mean, it would have been, you know, it would have been something that, that would have been, you know, beyond belief to people to even to seeing it rolling down the street. To the, Absolutely. To, to be yeah. so I just don't know. And I don't think anybody's prepared to give a bash at Nobody's it. Nobody's had a little dig work. inside to see. <laughs> I mean, maybe, a, maybe a stone column inside or a stone, stone work inside. Yeah. That's probably more likely, isn't it, given the early date? Anyway, we're getting lots of questions coming in, so don't be afraid. If you want to ask questions, um, do put something into the chat button at the bottom. So, first question coming up. Did chapel architects typically design the interiors as well and the fixtures and fittings? Um, in the early days, yes. I mean, it, I mean I, probably romantically, the way I see it, at the beginning is that is that you have a, a, a mason and a carpenter involved and very often in Wales it's the carpenter who did the design because they were better at drawing on a you know on a on a, on a smaller smaller scale so that one finds a lot of carpenters designing um, and then as it gets later on you get people who are sort of seeing the architect in them and the the kind of the the, the, the need to design everything so yeah. you, get, you get furniture and and building all designed by the same. But I've got a, quite a strong suspicion that that late on you also get specialist firms because they would have had to go to a specialist firm to get the pews and the pulpit and the and all of that made. And that the architect has a a relatively restrained minor role in the sense that the firm would have would have said, well, actually. You can have it arched or, or 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 square holes, and you can have cast iron in in the holes, or you can have no cast iron 
Um, yeah. but we're, not, we're not doing anything <laughs> you know, too far out. Yeah, uh, so so the earlier chapels are much more vernacular, much more hmm. home, but home yes. built, really. I think so, yes. Yeah, yeah. And another question here, is it the case that the grander chapels are the ones that have survived and that possibly many of the simpler, more modest ones have uh, been replaced? Well, yes. I mean, there are two things that happen. One is that the very simple ones were too small, and that's mm -hmm. true in towns as well as country, so that, uh, countryside, so that that one loses them anyway because chapels, you know, it's a, it was an emblem of, of, of success. So that thing that you find very much in Wales where you see on the front of a chapel, it says built 1720, rebuilt 1780, rebuilt yeah. 1820, and sometimes up to five of these. these oh, rebuilds. really? They're yeah. a statement of the growth of the, of, of, of the congregation. So mm. that in a way is the biggest reason for, uh, for um, chapels not being replaced. And I suspect that with the Unitarian in Taunton, that, that the Unitarians aren't growing in the way that other denominations are in the 19th century. Mm. So that they actually did put a, a new front on the chapel in the 1880s, but they were obviously not wealthy enough to- To, to be able to replace the whole entire thing. Very, yeah. Very yeah, oh, fascinating. Um, are there any examples of Anglican churches uh, taking inspiration from non-conformist chapels? Well, it is interesting. I mean, there are Victorian churches which were hated by the ecclesiologists, the people who, who wrote about how you should be medievalist, mm -hmm. and they're generally what were called low church. So they, they tend to be mainly Gothic, but they have, in order to get lots of people in, massive galleries behind the aisles, which, so that the criticism aimed at them is that they're too, they're too chapel-like. Yeah. Uh, and and you know, evangelical Anglicanism did did emphasise the preaching of the word more than say high church Anglicanism, which would have had the the communion and 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 and, and the the altar rails at the centre. Yes, so, yeah. Did, yeah. yeah. Um, yes. So any others? Somebody who's very I really enjoyed it and was delighted to hear from you. Excellent. Thank you. And another one who says. Uh, are many of these chapels listed to ensure that they are maintained? It's been, a, I mean, it, the problem is that, that the question that comes is what do you do with a chapel when the congregation can no longer maintain it? So mm -hmm. a lot of them are listed, but in order to find a new use, I mean, if you go to Ilminster to look at those nice stained glass windows or to look at the stone gallery that I showed, it's the art centre there. And of course, it means that what's missing is is the pews and and the 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 the, the, the pulpit has gone, but yeah. but the building has survived, and that's probably the the most likely thing that will happen is that that just practically, one will have to say, well, something has to go for the whole building to find a to find another use. It Ideally, is. They should stay in use. Yes. Absolutely, one always wants buildings to stay in use, but then it's always finding another use for them that's practical it's without actually practical, destroying yes. the actual fabric of the building. Really, you know, in London you see these extraordinary because everybody wants to squeeze something more residential into everything. So you see these oh. extraordinary chapels with sort of three rows of skylights in the roof or the small yeah, and the chimney. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh dear. Um, another one here, as a Times capsule was found in a demolished extension to Crewkern Methodist Church. Oh, right. Uh, um, have any other time capsules be found, been found in non-conformist churches? So somebody's found a time capsule in... Well, I mean, time capsules are only found when things are demolished. I mean, but my understanding of the of the foundation stone laying, which is often described in the newspapers, is that something or other is buried very, very regularly. I mean, it's not just in chapels, because you know, oh. things like, like 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 sort of statues and things often have have capsules with with a newspaper or a, or something buried there. So it's a question of when you demolish something. How careful are you before you bulldoze the, the the foundations? But but certainly, yeah, the 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 the, the that sort of Victorian thing of commemorating stuff is um is 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 terribly strong. And so that uh, and and that thing of modernity that you put in the time capsule, you know, you put a copy of that day's newspaper from the town and 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 and, and various bits in the old chapels. You find much more fun things which are um. <laughs> 
uh, mummified caps and shoes, and they're to do with with good luck. Yeah, sort of blessings, isn't it? Blessings and stuff. Yes. with scratch yes. marks and things. Yes, yes. In chimneys. Yes. <laughs> All those sorts of fascinating things. Um, oh, a little message here says, yes, the time capsule contained a newspaper and documents referring to circuit fundraising. Yes. Um, well, I mean, money is a huge thing. I mean, that's one of the extraordinary things is, of course, that, that these things are not cheap. You know, we're talking, you know, if, if one could make any equivalent by the late 19th century, things like South Petherton or Ilminster. I mean, they must have cost, you know, a million quid. I mean, what, how would you know? But I mean, the cost is huge and it's raised from the less you know you don't get you if you're lucky you get a clothier who'll give you 500 pounds towards it which may, might be a, a quarter of the cost yeah the rest of it has to be raised so that the question of of who they're always these very very long uh, booklets of every subscription you know starting at the top one and going right down to the people who gave not 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 pounds not shillings and and, uh, and one penny or one whatever. penny yeah <laughs> well, oh. that's lovely and delightful Absolutely brilliant. Um, you were talking about, I know it's not chapels, but the schools in Taunton were built for, did you say, different de denominations? Yes. I mean, it's quite odd that Taunton, I mean, it's not that they're all, you know, they aren't all over the country. You're not going to find, uh, you know, most of the minor of the private schools or what we call public schools mm. are Anglican denominations and they are not Anglican foundations. Yes. Uh, most, most of them. Uh, have a, a, a very strong Church of England uh, background. But there were denominational schools, and why are they so strong in Somerset? But oh. three of the major ones, you know, one in Bath and two in Taunton, are here. I don't really know. I mean, no. There's one in Headingley in Leeds that I know. I mean, there must be quite a, quite a, quite a few more, but it's, it's, it, it's odd that there's three of them should be in, in Somerset because I certainly didn't find any in Wiltshire, for instance. And, uh, yeah. Ah, fantastic. Um, slightly out of the area, but there's a surviving Bible Christian chapel in Chardstock, where my cousin's ancestors worshipped. Um, yeah. The chapel is now a holiday home to let. There you are. It's, I mean, I'd love the story. I mean, it would have been nice to, because the, the ones who are sort of architecturally less prominent, partly because there's, Sometimes they're smaller, sometimes they're later, so that the ones who didn't appear in my talk are people like the Bible Christians and the Primitive Methodists. Mm. And it's often that their chapels were small and they, they closed down very fast when, they, when, when the, 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 the congregation ran out. And then an awful lot got, got demolished until, the, you know, until the, the second home wave came. And, and, and you know, sometimes very curiously, you see a totally converted building with new windows and everything else. And the word well, you can um, recognise it for yeah, what primitive was. Methodist is written over the front door, which yeah, yeah. Is. <laughs> it was a yeah. funny shaped window stuck in the side. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A message here that says here in Wiltshire, relatively few chapels have been demolished, but most of the closed village ones have been turned into homes with varying degrees of success. Yes, yes I'm sure. I think we're better at it now. I must say, I saw. There's a very pretty one just over into Somerset at Falkland, which has been empty and looking a bit sad for as long as I've known it, really. Mm. And um, and I drove past it, and it's it's been very you know it's been very tidily converted into a into a yeah. house. I'm keeping it's, the whole the exterior intact. Yeah, it is so important, really, to make buildings used again in some way. Otherwise, yeah. they just disappear, don't they? they? Disappear, yes, absolutely, yes. Yeah. Which brings us off nicely towards the end, I think, Julian. Um, we finished having questions coming in. And um, I just thank you very much for a really fascinating talk. I've, I'm now fired up to go out and look for chapels um, <laughs> all over Somerset. <laughs> thank, thank you very, you very much. much indeed. Thank you. <laughs> So everybody else, um, don't forget, um, Sands has got a few live events coming up soon um, on Saturday, the 21st of May at 10 o'clock. Uh, the Local History Committee is having, oh no, it's the Archaeology and the Local History Committee um, having a live day looking at Roman discoveries and their event will be at St Andrew's Church Hall um, in Taunton. And if you want to book for that, please do it through the SANS office.
on the 19th of June, the Local History Committee are taking a, a tour around the highlights of medieval Exeter, looking at the underground passages there. Again, uh, booking through the office at um, in Sarnes. And on the 2nd of July, the Historic Buildings Committee are going to be doing a tour around Bridgewater. Again, book through the Sands office. The, the, the um, email address is on the website. Uh, any other details of events will be on the um, events page on the website. And of course, if you want to join Sands, just go to the website again. Um, details. Um, yeah, that only leaves me to thank Julian for a brilliant talk and, of course, the webinar team, Nathaniel, Tony and Harriet, and thank you for coming. So hopefully we'll see you again uh, for some more webinars in the autumn and perhaps even at a live event. So thank you very much and goodbye to everybody.